Hello. Welcome to the next unit in the book. Now we've covered the last one, which was, uh, let's be honest, pretty boring. Um, instructions is a bit of a, a lazy chapter in the book where they, they clearly couldn't be bothered to do something properly. So they just borrowed things from other books and kind of recycled it. The next one is a lot more valuable and a lot more useful. And unfortunately for you, we're gonna be going into a lot more depth. Um, so if you turn to page, I'm, I've lost it, hold on a minute. Unit three, page 73, narratives. Now narratives are a fancy word for stories. A story laid out is a narrative. And the reason this is gonna be going into a lot more depth is because this is very much what I do. Um, I'm a novelist, I write books, I write short stories, I write articles and blogs, but mostly I focus on narratives. Um, I've spent years developing this, years working on this, and this is something I really enjoy teaching. Um, and I think it's something that's very, very important. And I'll explain why over the course of this unit, why this is such an important unit in the book and this is such an important topic. Stories aren't just stories. Stories teach us um, all about how the world works and how um, older people want you to see the world. Um, now we've mentioned this before in class. Um, fairy stories, for instance, the old legendary fairy stories, have a point, they all have a purpose. Um, a couple of great examples would be um, Little Red Riding Hood. Now in Little Red Riding Hood, we've got an on the surface narrative of a young girl who wears a red hood, who goes out into the forest and is eventually eaten and killed by a wolf. Now in the original story, uh, it kills her grandmother and then it kills and eats her as well. Um, that was changed because, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, now the reason that this story existed and was so violent and so bloody is because it was meant to give you a gut punch. It was meant to hurt you as, as, a, as an audience member. It was meant to shock you because the reason is the wolf represents uh, life and you are the child. You're the one projecting yourself into Little Red Riding Hood. The story is meant to make a point about childhood and how dangerous childhood is if you don't listen to the good advice from your parents. Now, if Little Red Riding Hood had done what her mother said and gone through the woods without stopping and talking to strangers, nothing would have happened. Her grandmother, <coughs> excuse me, grandmother would have survived. She would not have got eaten by the wolf. Everybody would have been happy. Dogs and cats would have lived together, it would have stopped raining, and donuts would have been free. It would have been fantastic. A new world for everybody. But she didn't, and so she was killed. This makes a great point to the children that, you know, I've really, really got to listen to my parents. Uh, another one would be the three little pigs. Now, this is a bit more complex. Now, in the story of the three little pigs, we've got these three pigs. Uh, one makes a house out of straw, one makes it out of bricks, uh, one makes it out of wooden sticks. Um, the wolf comes for them and he kills two out of the three pigs. Now there are variations on the story, but let's go with the original one where he starts with the straw house, blows the straw house down, eats the pig, then moves on to the stick house, does the same, moves on to the brick house, can't blow the house down. Now there's two variations on the story. Even, no one really knows which was the original. Um, in one of them he just walks away and in the other one he comes down the chimney and is boiled alive. I think I prefer the original version uh, of the two I just said where he can't blow down the brick house, he gives up and walks away because this is a better um, example of how life works. Again, we've got the wolf, the evil wolf, representing life. Life is coming for you. And the three little pigs don't represent three physical pigs. They represent you on your journey through life. We start as a child doing things as cheaply, lazily, and as easily as possible. We build our house out of straw. We learn a few tricks, and we build our house out of sticks. We build them out of bits of wood, and it's better but they're not gonna last, and life is gonna come for us, and it's gonna destroy our house, and we only survive, and we only succeed when we finally become the last pig who builds his house out of bricks. So in other words, you learn all through the stages of childhood towards doing the job correctly, and it's the only way that it can be done. Otherwise, it's gonna fall apart. Life is gonna come up and destroy you. So we go through those three stages. It's, it's a story that sounds on the surface rather sophisticated for a child's mind, but unconsciously, even a young child, even, even James, five years old, would be able to pick up on what this story is really all about. It's all about learning to do things properly, and we understand that at an unconscious level. Um, we've also got things like The Little Mermaid. Now, The Little Mermaid was changed um, very badly by Disney 
to make it have a happy ending. In the original ending, it's not a happy ending at all. She, um, she goes onto the land she's warned not to, and eventually she turns into sea foam. She melts away, because the story is about identity. Um, think about what Americans are doing now. They're trying to pretend that women can be men and men can be women. Women can, uh, women can turn into uh, masculine creatures, and masculine creatures can now have babies. That's nonsense, and we all know it's nonsense. And the original story of The Little Mermaid is that when she goes on land, she is rejecting who she really is. She's pretending that she's something she's not. She's lost track of her own identity. And when you lose track of who you really are, when you give up your identity, you become nothing. So she dissolves into sea foam and just melts away. That's what happens in the original story. Now, that's not a narrative that modern Disney or modern Hollywood wants to portray. You know, stick to your identity, learn who you really are. But that's really what life's about. If we look at the Three Little Pigs narrative, we go through each of the three stages as we grow into a better, stronger person, that we can do things right and we can, we can survive better. And then, of course, we, we learn to establish our identity through other stories like The Little Mermaid, and we learn that the consequence of not finding out who we really are and then being the best version of ourselves, the consequence is to have nothing. We just lose ourselves. And all of these stories have elements of this, Cinderella, um, all these other stories, they're all put together to teach children the valuable lessons that you have to learn through life. <clears throat> You've got a choice. You can either learn them the hard way by letting life beat the crap out of you, or you can learn them the fun way through stories. And that's what narratives are. Narratives are taking us from where we are into a story where it happens to somebody else. Now, stories are incredibly valuable. Um, you learn history. Now, history is meant to be an ongoing lesson so that we can always look back at our past and think, this is what happened. These are the facts, these are the figures. But a book written by a human being experiencing things years ago, now that's a, a literal time machine. That can take you back into the mind of somebody seeing it firsthand for themselves. Now, that's why horror stories, like real genuine horror stories written during wartime are so valuable. First They Killed My Father, and, and millions of books written about World War I, World War I specifically because it was so brutal and so awful. It takes us into the mind of somebody who was really there, and it teaches us one important lesson, that this can never be allowed to happen again. And that's why these stories are so valuable. They, they can take us into somebody else's experience to give us a genuine first-hand experience of what it might have been like to be there. We don't get that from a history book. I can tell you that the Pol Pot region happened, uh, the Pol Pot time happened so many years ago and it lasted for so long. But those are facts. When we read about what it was like for someone actually seeing it for themselves, that's a whole different thing. And that hits you on an emotional level, and we're emotional creatures. And that's why these kind of stories, these narratives, have such value. Even fictional stories, and I write mostly fictional stories, but I do it so that I can embed metaphors and allegory, and I can teach things that I've learned along the way through life. I can teach them to other people. I can give them the lessons that I've picked up the hard way so that they can understand them the easy way and not make the same mistakes I've made. And that's what stories could do. Stories can teach us, they can educate, they can transport us to different times and places, and they can take us on a journey into something that we would never experience. You've read, uh, many of you have probably read Harry Potter. You are never gonna be um, a young boy coming from England. You are never gonna be a wizard. You are never gonna be living in Hogwarts. You are never gonna be all of these things. But when you read that story, just for a little while, you are. Another better example of this would be James Bond. Now, I know most of you have never read the books, um, but you've probably heard of him or at least seen the movies. Um, and they've really, really screwed up the movies lately. But in the original James Bond, um, and I grew up reading the books. I mean, the books were already very, very old when I was born. I mean, the, the earliest movies, uh, the early movies of James Bond came out decades before I was even born. So this is, this is an old genre. James Bond was written by a man, um, Ian Fleming, um, who survived through World War II. And he was an intelligent man, and he was taken on as a spy during World War II and beyond. So he understood what being a spy was like. It was terrifying. Uh, Ian Fleming said it was the worst thing that's ever happened to him. He was suddenly just an ordinary man, taken out of his life and thrown into a world where he could be killed like that. Every single person around him, every time he walked into a bar, there could be a man watching him who was going to stab him in the back with a knife. He never knew if he was going to survive the day, the hour, the minute, the second. 
and it was a horrifying experience. So when he wrote James Bond, the idea was to take you, the audience, into a world that you should never have to live through. He was taking you on a journey into fiction so that you could see it from his perspective. So James Bond was what we call an everyman character. When he started out in the books, James Bond is just an ordinary man with no special abilities who sees the world through our eyes. So we go inside James Bond. We imagine ourselves as James Bond and we see this dreadful, awful world that really did exist, projected for us in a fictional setting so that we can imagine what it would be like to be surrounded by death and horror, but a real kind of horror where it's coming for us psychologically every second. And that's the value of narratives. That's why they're so important and that's what attracted me to telling stories uh, when I was very much younger than you. And in fact, it started with me with, uh, uh, see, I, I write on uh, edgeverse.org. That's my, my website. I write with my oldest best friend, Seth. Um, now, we met at school, and I think we were about 11 years old, and I just watched this dreadful, awful science fiction movie at the weekend. Because we love science fiction. We grew up with uh, um, Star Trek and Star Wars, and we, we loved it. Everybody loves sci-fi. Just like your generation love uh, fantasy, like Twilight and Harry Potter and all that kind of stuff, because that's the kind of uh, media that you've had. In my generation, we had Star Wars and Star Trek and lots of other science fiction, so we loved science fiction. Um, and I'd seen this dreadful sci-fi movie and I said, ah, oh, it was really bad. It was so bad that even I could do better. And he said, you know what, prove it. And I've spent the rest of my life doing exactly that, trying to prove that I can write a better story. Um, and now, um, unfortunately for him, he got dragged into my world too. So now we're both writing novels together. And we, we do write sci-fi, horror, all sorts of other stuff. Um, and we, we work together to, to write um, the kind of books that we want to read. Um, so yeah, happened together. So let's have a look at page 73, unit three, narratives. So unit outcomes. By the end of this unit, you'll be able to listen for features of narratives. Now I know the features of narratives so well that me and uh, Seth, my, my oldest friend, who now lives in Japan, we wrote, if you go to our website, uh, a novel approach. And a novel approach is a literal guide how to write a novel. We wrote everything about writing a novel. We've got articles all over the site about exactly this. How to see the features of narratives, how to put a narrative together, how to write a story, how to improve your story. So this is something that I really understand and really, really strongly believe in. Um, read and understand narratives, poetry and science fiction. Um, not as easy as you think. Um, understanding narratives there's a surface narrative and there's a much more complex narrative beneath. Now a very, very good filmmaker, uh, Stanley Kubrick, once made a film called 2001. Now in 2001 it's about aliens who are represented by a big black obelisk. It just appears. Um, and the surface narrative is that the human race have discovered these black obelisks and through history these black objects are aliens that have been teaching us how to do things. That's the surface narrative. Now really, the beyond the surface narrative is a whole different story. And you have to be able to look through the surface narrative to even understand what the film is really all about. Most people can't. But the black obelisk, if you measure it, is exactly the same size as a cinema screen turned on its side. And all the way through is a little references in the movie telling you, look at it on its side. So when you turn it round to the side, every time you see the black object, really what it's telling you is there's now a new story and you've got to look through the surface narrative. Now that's an extreme example of how surface narratives work, but all stories to a degree have a surface and a, and a subsurface narrative. Now the last time I taught this in grade uh, 11, I guess, uh, my class challenged me to do um, Frozen. And my wife loved it too. My wife likes Frozen. So she said, yeah, analyze Frozen. So I said, all right, you know what, we'll do it. So I got out my notebook, we put on Frozen, and I sat there and I made notes all the way through it. And we watched Frozen and I tried to find the surface narrative and then look beyond to see what the film was really all about. And really what it's about is the two characters, Elsa and her sister, are not two characters. It's one person. It's one person split into two. So what you've got is if you look at the models, the CGI models of the two characters, they're identical except for a color change. And that's trying to warn you psychologically, unconsciously, this is the same person. And there's lots of little hints in it all the way through. There's lots of um, references. I've done a video on this. If you want to go to my, uh, my YouTube channel, you can, you can watch it. It's quite long, it's about 45 minutes of how this is uh, split. There's lots of references to uh, split personalities and this not being real and look look further to see what's really going on and there's uh, the, the overwhelming evidence is the bit where the um, Elsa 
um, runs away from the palace and then she creates her ice palace, it's, it's within seconds. She literally turns up at the ice palace three or four seconds later and the others take two days to get there. So they're not really going somewhere physically. She's imagined herself there. And all the way through, it's like whenever she's split from one character to another, nobody talks to her. Nobody actually speaks directly to her face. When they're talking to her, they're actually looking at the other character. So all the way through is this um, underlying narrative that these are really one girl who's who's split you know she's got this idea that she wants to be a young free spirit and live her life but she's got the duty to the throne and it's divided her loyalties two ways um, there's actually another narrative to it as well um, the, the the reason that she's getting the split is because um, she's growing up she's just about at that age where a woman is coming to realize that she's no longer a young girl that men are starting to notice her and that's why we get the song at the end where she sings um, uh, let it go and she changes clothes and her clothes become um, adult you know she goes from having younger female clothes that cover everything to being more revealing and it's not an accident she's a young girl uh, becoming a woman um, the, uh, the second movie is even darker. Believe me, it's got some really nasty themes in it. I didn't do a full analysis of that one, but I was dragged to the cinema. And the surface narrative is the same. It's, a, it's about a woman um, on her wedding night doing that thing for the first time. That's really what it's about. That's why the dam is about to burst open and she's about to be flooded. And when the flood happens, everything's fine after all because it was nowhere near as bad as she thought it was going to be. It's all about that first time. Nasty stuff. Disney does this a lot. And this is unconsciously picked up by a very, very young audience. So be careful. Seeing a narrative is not as easy as you think it's going to be. Um, poetry and science fiction. Science fiction is something I absolutely love. We are going to look at science fiction a bit more uh, closely. Um, Somebody mentioned in one of the Halloween videos that um, Frankenstein was the first science fiction. That's not strictly true. Um, science fiction has been going back many, many thousands of years. Um, but it's true in that it's the first modern science fiction. Science fiction um, aims to take any given subject and ask, what if? Science fiction is basically looking at the world, applying logic and reason, and asking what would happen if I changed a few details, and then we went forward from that moment. Um, you could argue even that Harry Potter would be science fiction, because it asks, what if these things were real? What if magic was real and it was happening right now? And so long as there's some kind of scientific explanation for why it could happen, then it's science fiction. Uh, it's all about interpretation uh, and poetry. I vehemently dislike poetry and poets in general. Uh, if you go to my website, we have, um, we have the world's finest collection of poetry by an author, um, uh, Al Warcock. Um, and it's literally, we did it as a joke. We, we, me and my, my colleague, we wrote a load of awful, awful, dreadful poems that were just literally a joke about how awful poetry, modern poetry has become. And we started posting it on poetry forums. And um, the guys in the poetry forums kept saying, oh, that's so good. So we wrote a whole book about it and we published it. And we, we laughingly said, it's the best book of poetry that's available today. And, and a lot of people came and said, yeah, it's really good. And it's not, it's ridiculous. I mean, one of the jokes, uh, the, the title of the poem is, it's called The Melon Collie. It's about a collie dog that eats melons <laughs> and dies because it eats melons. Um, and everyone's going, oh, so deep, so, so rich in metaphors. It's like, no, it's just a made up piece of nonsense that we, one of them's about a chicken and how it becomes a chicken curry. You know, it's, it's the life of a chicken curry. It, the, the chicken gets its head ripped off and thinks, yeah, I didn't like that. It's a ridiculous poem, but um, people are stupid. Uh, poetry is terrible. We'll look at old poetry and how it changed into modern poetry and what went wrong. Um, use grammatical features, obviously. Uh, describe characters and settings. Characters are almost more important than the narrative. The narrative is the story, the way the story builds and lays out. Um, I would argue, um, and it's not my argument, but there's a lot of writers that would agree, um, the characters are more important than the story because without the characters, you don't care. You know, I could tell you a James Bond story, but instead I could put in um, James, and it wouldn't make any sense. And no one wants to see that story told from the perspective of a five-year-old child. It doesn't work. Getting the character right makes the story work because we need to lead the audience in in a certain way. Uh, the characters have to be sympathetic. Now that doesn't mean they have to be good, it means that you have to be able to 
empathize with them. You have to see yourself looking through their eyes. You have to understand how they feel uh, for a story to work. Um, I would also say that a character is going to be remembered long, long after you've forgotten the story. Um, if I looked at uh, Star Wars, for instance, if you said to me, you know, tell me something about Star Wars, the first thing I would say would be, you've got the main three characters, Luke, Han, and Leah, and they all go on their journey, and each one of them becomes better and more morally correct because they go on a series of adventures that expose them to the realities of the universe. So basically, all I'm doing is I'm taking the three characters and showing you how they change. And that's what's really important about a story. Not at any point there did I actually mention anything that happens in the story. I've told you what happens to the three main characters because that's what's really important. Um, settings, I would argue settings are not so important, but they do tell us a lot about a story. I, um, in, in the book we wrote, it goes through, uh, there are three levels of setting. Uh, there's extremely realistic settings. If I wrote a story and said, it's set in Phnom Penh, then that gives you the expectation that the story is grounded, believable, and realistic. Uh, then we have um, made-up settings. Now, if I said it was set in a, um, an, an Asian third world country, then it would be, okay, I'd expect it to be realistic, but not 100% factual. So it wouldn't be as, as down-to-earth and grounded as if I actually mentioned the name of a real city. And then finally, we can just say, doesn't matter where it's set, because it's about the story. And those three different levels of settings tell us a lot about what kind of story we're about to read. Um, a very, very strictly well-engineered and accurate story would mention a city by name. Um, if we don't mention it by name, we have a fictional version of it, then it's, it's an interpretation. And then if it's just a made-up place, doesn't really matter because we're not talking about the setting. So there are different levels of settings that, that tell us different things about the story. Uh, give a description and work in a group to tell a story. Hopefully, we'll be back to school soon and that can actually happen. Solve problems in creative ways. Um, wow, yeah. Um, we see this on the forums a lot. Uh, one of the biggest questions that people answer is, how do I continue my story? What do I do next? I've, I've started writing and my character's gone left and right and I don't know what to do next. You have to be able to solve that problem. You have to be able to come up with solutions um, before you can actually create a story. Most people don't plan the story out in the first place, so their stories fail for that very reason. Um, we haven't solved the problems. We've created new problems for ourselves. A lot of people, unfortunately, these days, are that stupid and they think they have a right to write a story. Writing a story is very difficult. It can take at least 10 years just to master the art of being able to write, let alone actually creating a story worth reading and creating the characters and everything else. Uh, and they think they should just be given the privilege of being able to write a story and of course it goes wrong and then they go and say, well, how do I solve this problem? Well, you've caused the problem for yourself by yourself, so it's up to you to fix it. The only way, in a lot of these uh, examples, the only way to fix it is to give up. Um, you either have to admit that you're not a writer and go away and do something else or abandon the story that you've invested hundreds of hours in uh, and next time learn to plan it properly. So you need to find creative solutions. Describe characters and events and write a story. We'll see if we get to that. We'll see. I won't be doing it if we're still online, just from the point of view of trying to market. Uh, okay, so let's have a look at overview. Um, creative writing uses the language of imagination. I would say that writing is painting. It's painting a story in your imagination using words instead of paint. So um, the importance of writing a novel um, over, over a story uh, made into a movie is that I'm literally involving two people in the process, me and you. I'm describing it, you're imagining it, there's only two people involved in the entire thing. It's just one circle between two. Um, for that reason, I'm literally taking my thoughts and putting them into your head. And that never works perfectly. And it can't work perfectly, and that's the beauty of reading a book. Um, no two people read a book the same way. Um, I could put my wife next to me. Now, me and my wife are very similar in many ways. Uh, that's the reason that we got married in the first place. We, we agree with many of the same things. We are similar people. We have similar outlooks on life. We have strong morals, etc. We believe in the same thing. But if I had the same book for two of us, we would both read it in a different way. We'd both imagine the characters to look different. We'd imagine the settings to be different. And that's the beauty of a book. No two people see them the same way. Um, and that's why a film 
is different. And that's why uh, I much prefer for somebody to read a book because it's, it brings the story really to life in your own imagination. Um, the language helps the reader or the listener to, to see characters and experience situations. Um, experiencing the situations is really the goal and it can only work if we've done our job properly in creating vibrant characters, realistic settings and we've given you enough uh, and this is the trick that a lot of writers can't do. We've given you enough information to make you imagine it, but not so much that you're drowning in detail. Um, it's like with a movie, you can go too far. I can give you too much information and I can take away the fun of imagining it for yourself. And then it doesn't work. Um, it's a fine line. Um, the writer or speaker creates uh, characters and decides how the characters should think and behave. Um, I would agree with that to a point. Uh, it's got to be logical. Um, if I create a character, I do a lot of research in making them feel as real as I can, um, unless it's a comedy, in which case we want them to be um, exaggerated. But normally I would try and make my characters act in believable ways. And this is what we do not see in modern uh, cinema movies, especially feminist movies. We have the, the latest trend is in gender swapping out a movie so that we take male characters, we swap them for female characters, but really it's just a girl playing a man. And it makes no sense. Charlie's Angels was a brilliant example of this. Um, although in Charlie's Angels I would say, obviously, it was originally a cast of women. But where in the original TV series of Charlie's Angels we took three women who were intelligent and they solved their problems as women. In the new one, they're basically three men and they go around beating people up. So you've got these gigantic Russian bodyguards and this little girl about this size is beating the crap out of him. And it makes no sense. And the audience is looking at it thinking, I can't believe this. This drags me out of the narrative. Black Widow did exactly the same thing. It's got these little tiny women beating up men twice their size who are supposed to be indestructible. And it makes no sense in it. It makes the audience just go, mm, I don't care. Um, women are different to men and you need to write them accordingly and make them believable if you want the audience to care about them. And this is why people are moaning about modern movies and saying that you know, they're not interesting to watch because we don't have women behave like women. Um, now, I'm not suggesting you watch this film, but um, some of my favorite movies uh, is Alien and Aliens and uh, Terminator 1 and 2. Uh, and in both of those examples, both of those sets of movies, we have extremely interesting female characters. And these are from movies from the 80s. Um, Terminator especially starts off with uh, Sarah Connor. She's 18 in the movie. She's uh, a waitress. She's a loser. She doesn't know who she is, where she is. And then she makes a discovery. Life around her changes. She um, has no choice. Because she's a woman, she's, uh, she has to support and defend her, her unborn son. Uh, so she has to learn how to fight, and she does, and she rises to the challenge. She becomes a, a fascinating and interesting character, and she behaves believably. Um, same thing in Alien. We have um, uh, Ellen Ripley uh, in Alien. And uh, this is a horror movie, so you know, I, I should, if, if you're up for it, absolutely watch it. They're a fantastic sets of movies. But Ellen Ripley starts out, she's on board a spaceship, and she's literally the only woman with any common sense. The rest of the crew act like idiots. She's the one who's smart, and because of that, she survives and everybody else dies. So, you know, we used to write these characters believably and they would succeed because they were women who were intelligent, not because they were women who went around kicking men about, uh, because that's not what happens in the real world and we know that. Believable characters sell a story. Um, creators create worlds for their characters and they show how these characters react to different situations and solve problems. Yeah, okay, I would, uh, I would say that. Uh, one of the key elements of writing a narrative is to create problems for our characters to overcome. Um, that can't be the whole story, of course, but that's, that's what we do. Now, someone's highlighted this, so excuse me, it's difficult to read. Stories and fictional narratives. Readers can empathize with the character in the stories they read and observe what happens as the story unfolds. Now, empathizing means understanding. We can sympathize, we can imagine what they feel, and we can feel it along with them. Um, for a story to really work, you actually do feel what the character feels. Now, interestingly, and this is why Hollywood movies do this, this is why Hollywood movies try to sell you these ridiculous ideas. The characters in stories, your brain cannot tell the difference between them and real people. So if I kill a character in one of my stories and you're invested and you really like that character, it'll feel exactly the same way as if you lose a friend who has the same status. 
You can't tell the difference. The idea that Hollywood has is that they can rebuild society. And they openly say this, that they're reconstructing society. They're trying to change how people think by creating these unbelievable characters in the hope that they can change the world into this unbelievable ideal. And it doesn't work because we can't be pushed that far. The human genome doesn't work that way. Um, yeah, so writing these characters and making them go through these believable traits is, is key to writing. Um, as an example, I have a beta tester. She reads all of my books. Uh, so what I do is when I finish the book, I send it to her. She gives me emotional feedback. And if I've screwed up, that's how we find the mistake. And on the third book of a trilogy, uh, Hawkeye, um, one of my characters, Merv, uh, we started out with, it's three characters, so we've gone through the first book, gone through the second book, and I sent her the third and said, yeah, we're gonna, I changed things around in this book. She said, you better not have killed Merv. And she was quite angry about it, you better not have killed Merv. I said, well, you'll have to find out, won't you? But she was, she was angry um, because she didn't think I'd kill the other two characters, but I threatened that things were gonna change, and she was worried that I was gonna murder one of my characters because she loved the characters. Um, she was probably seeing them in a totally different way to the way I wrote them, and that doesn't really matter. Um, the story, when you've read it, the story belongs to you just as much as it belongs to the writer. So people do invest in these characters, and you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have got posters on the walls, you've got a, a little crush on a fictional character, or you have at some point. This was becoming news. Uh, uh, guys were investing in female characters, uh, girls were starting to have crushes on male characters. It's, it's not unusual, it's normal, um, because these characters, your brain can't tell the difference. It doesn't understand that these people aren't real people. Um, uh, through fictional narratives, readers can also explore social and cultural values and discover alternative ways of looking at issues. Um, I agree if it's done maturely. Um, we can explore cultural, social things. Uh, in the original Hawkeye book that I wrote, I was talking about the surveillance state and the danger of always being watched by a government that you know you can't trust. Um, but I tried to present both sides of it. I actually had a dialogue between two of the characters, one of them saying, you shouldn't be watching this, it's, it's wrong, it's morally reprehensible. Um, and then the other character said, you also just told me to do more of it. Um, because another character had died, and he said, oh, if, only, if only we'd had more cameras on this person, we might have been able to save his life. And she said, yes, that's the, why we do it. So I tried to show both sides of it by having an argument. Should we be watching, or should we be watching more? Which is it? And I had both characters uh, eventually not being able to answer the question because I trusted my audience to have answered it for themselves. They have to decide. I've presented both sides of it, looked at it in two different ways, given the information to the audience, and trust the audience to work out for themselves what they have as an opinion. That's how it should be done. Now, in Hollywood movies, it absolutely isn't. There are no right-wing movies ever made in Hollywood. Everything is left-wing, and that's extremely dangerous and unbalanced. It's like with uh, YouTube and all the social media channels. You cannot um, be anti-left-wing. You, you're censored, you're blocked. You can't, um, you can't question any of the things that they don't like. Um, I can't even talk about it on this YouTube channel because literally they would block the video and I wouldn't be able to upload it. And that's insane. That's incredibly dangerous. So you can't be right wing. Uh, fictional narratives are uh, categorized according to the setting and the type of um, action that takes place. And this is a very weak look at how narratives work. Traditional stories take place in the past. Uh, contemporary, realistic stories take place in the present. They don't have to be realistic. Um, I, don't even, I wouldn't even call them traditional, historical stories, contemporary stories, uh, historical stories take place in the distant past, the history of the time is usually true. Mm. Science fiction stories are, <laughs> are based on imaginary scientific discoveries in the future, that's not true, <laughs> it's not true, fantasy, adventure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work through this. Um, science fiction can be set in the present. It, so long as it is based on something that we know to be true and asks the question, what if, uh, then it can be science fiction. So long as it has a scientific basis in fact. Now anything that's fact-based and asks what if we change the rules or we reimagine how things are, that it could be science fiction. Um, fantasy uh, makes no attempt to be realistic. 
Fantasy is the realms of Harry Potter or Divergent or uh, Twilight, where there's no, we don't say that vampires are real or were real or could ever be real. We simply have it as it is. We, we present it, yep, it's real. We, the Harry Potter world is real, we look at it in the story and we believe it. Uh, and we don't need an explanation. Um, those of you that are interested in science fiction, I would also say sci-fi breaks down as well. Um, I grew up watching Star Trek and Star Wars. Now in Star Trek, whenever they need to do something with a ship, they explain how they're gonna do it and why they're going to do it. We're gonna change how we travel through warp by changing this and this and this, and we use this theory. That's science fiction. But in Star Wars, interestingly, you've got these main characters and all we need to know is that they know it. We say, uh, I'm going to travel from this planet to this planet on the other side of the galaxy by pressing this button. So that's really sci-fi fantasy because we never get a scientific explanation for why we have to accept the world exists, <coughs> excuse me, because the characters living in it underst <coughs> understand it. So that's, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, borderline fantasy. A ah, lot of talking. Um, <coughs> adventure stories are just that. A good example of those would be Indiana Jones, um, and there's loads of different stories based on that. There's lots of adventurers that go off literally just for the sake of having an adventure. <coughs> um, historical stories are based in the past, and we've got different versions of those. We've got realistic historical and unrealistic historical. I could set um, mythology in the past. I mean, if I wanted to tell a story about King George and the Dragon, it's supposed to be a legend. It's supposed to have some basis in uh, fact. Even though, um, even though it, it's hard to come to terms with the idea of uh, dragons living in England. We've certainly got no historical evidence of it. But it would be a historical story because people in the past uh, have said it happened. So we've got some basis of historical fact. Uh, all the way through to one of the most popular American ones is Westerns, where there are a few hundred years ago <clears throat> where Americans were settling the country um, and starting to build the cities that they have today. Uh, that's a very popular um, historical version of fiction. So as in uh, fictional narratives, <clears throat> imaginative language can be used in poetry to create characters and situations. Poetry, I'm not gonna get into poetry, uh, that's a whole different thing. So we're not gonna talk about poetry today. Um, poetry is a very different thing, and it's something that again, like narratives, has gone very, very wrong. Um, that's why I hate it. Um, traditional poetry I have no problem with. Modern poetry uh, is absolute um, garbage. Absolute garbage. I completely hate it. Um, so that's a very, very basic introduction to what narratives are and why they have such value. Um, we're going to go into this in a lot more detail. Uh, we're going to look at how narratives are put together, how they're structured, how they work. Uh, we're going to look at how to take them apart and we're going to look at how to put them back together. Okay. <clears throat>